and, and thank you for joining us here at Zach to talk about the drug development process and also how we apply it, apply it to our evaluation methodology. I want to thank uh, Jeff Walker uh, and Shelly uh, for doing all the background work on the webinar and also um, thank everyone who's attending today. Uh, just a bit on my background, uh, I was formerly a healthcare analyst at a Dallas Money Manager and then a healthcare evaluation consultant with a firm based out of Atlanta. And now in the biotech analyst at Zach's small cap research where we focus on companies with market caps below a billion. Uh, many of the biotech companies that we cover are free revenue, which means that they have a good idea in the works, but their drug has not yet passed through all of the clinical trials and regulatory hurdles required before commercialization. Therefore, it's our job as analysts to figure out what these companies are worth. This is a multi-step process which consists of estimating what ultimate revenues will be and also how a candidate drug will progress from an idea to commercialization. We'll also cover the process that a sponsor follows to shepherd a drug through the development and regulatory process and provide key data that can help value a drug pipeline as it progresses towards approval. We'll also look at the duration of patent and exclusivity protection that can be expected from a sponsor when they eventually generate sales. Our goal with this presentation is to help clarify the relevant information related to drug development, thereby improving our analysis and valuation of biotech companies. All right, we're on slide two. Um, medical product development is a wide-ranging and expensive effort that's required before any pharmaceutical, device, or biologic may be marketed or sold. The process varies slightly by geography, but maintains common features emphasizing safety and efficacy. The process is also very time consuming, and development can span a decade or more with extremely high failure rates. For medicines, some analysis has shown that for every 10,000 compounds that are initially examined, only one of them is eventually approved by the FDA. Understanding the process and pitfalls that healthcare product companies face are key to assessing the risks and rewards of drug development. The process includes initial work in the lab that seeks to identify promising compounds and then narrow down this group through rational, structural, and computer-assisted drug design. These ideas are tested in animal models and eventually in humans using phased trials and then are taken to the FDA or other regulatory agency for approval. If approval is granted, then the sponsor may market the drug. Even though only a very few compounds are able to make it through this very arduous, time-consuming, and expensive process, there are many incentives that drive sponsors to undertake the risk. High drug prices are one, and annual therapy costs of over 50000 per patient are common in many orphan and cancer indications. Intellectual property protection through patents and exclusivity are other incentives that keep sponsors in the game. There are also accelerated pathways that help incentivize medicines that address small populations or provide a considerable benefit to those with few other options. Frequently, a drug's protection is extended through new formulations and new delivery methods, but eventually it'll be eligible for generic competition. In this last phase of a drug's life, competitors are able to create a generic copy of a drug which has the benefit of increasing competition and making the drug available to a larger number of patients. To quickly summarize the pathway followed by a drug as it moves from basic research to an approved compound, take a look at the slide on your screen. It shows how we go from a huge number of compounds in the basic research stage to an FDA-approved medicine. The process quickly funnels down from about 10,000 candidates to only one approved drug. The time investment can be as much as 15 years with costs rising into the billions of dollars. The costs support the medicines as they walk through the steps of preclinical work, submitting an investigational new drug application, phased trials, a new drug application, and finally obtaining the FDA's response. The research phases of drug development are very involved and include some very technical procedures. We can see on the slide that the process is broken up into discovery, preclinical development, and clinical development. These experiments examine the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of compounds to determine their safety and effectiveness. As we saw on the previous slide and in this one, sometimes there are even post-marketing studies called 
Phase 4 trials that look at long-term effects of approved drugs in what are called post-marketing surveillance trials. In certain situations, Phase 4 trials are required as a condition of approval and in other cases may be used for marketing purposes. In the discovery and development stage, drug sponsors use a number of approaches to narrow down molecules into potential drug targets. These approaches include rational drug design, which is based on knowledge of a biological target and usually focuses on an organic small molecule. Computer-aided design enlists the use of software that can sift through millions of compounds seeking binding targets and eliminating candidates with undesirable properties. Other processes include combinatorial chemistry, which uses a synthetic method to create vast numbers of compounds in a single process that can be used in biological assays. Phenotypic screening is used to identify small molecules, peptides, or RNAi that can alter the phenotype of a cell or organism in a desired manner. After discovery of a promising compound, scientists move into in vitro and in vivo studies. In vitro testing allows the scientists to examine how a drug will interact with its surroundings and may focus on specific cells, DNA sequences, or proteins. In vivo studies build on what was learned in the in vitro stage and serve to verify assumptions regarding re reaching the intended target, side effects, or other factors. Animal model testing takes the first pass at the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion qualities of the compound, helping to determine how the drug will enter, interact, and exit the body. After a sponsor has performed all the required analysis to estimate safety and efficacy, then they apply for permission to use the drug in human clinical trials. This requires the submission of an Investigational New Drug Application, or IND, to the FDA. If there's no response or clinical hold from the FDA after 30 days, then the sponsor may proceed with Phase I trials. Let's take a minute to look at some statistics on the cost of developing a drug before we get into the details of the phase trials. We performed a review of several studies conducted over the last decade and a half to see what the estimated costs are for developing a drug. There are several factors to consider in this analysis, including cost of capital, the cost of drugs that fail or are never approved, allocated costs, which are especially relevant for large pharma organizations, length of time to develop, and regulatory agency application costs. Of course, the amount that a sponsor is willing to spend depends on the size of potential revenues. In this slide, our source has provided a summary of what to consider when determining the cost to develop a drug. The amounts listed here are quite a bit lower than what was shown in the previous slide, but do provide some context in terms of the relative cost for each of the trial phases. As we can see, the cost of the phases increase substantially as we move from one to three. If you take a closer look here, you can see in this 2003 analysis, and note that there has been a lot of inflation since 2003 in these costs, but phase one ran at about 15 million. Uh, phase two uh, jumped up to 23 million, and then on average, phase three was 86 to $87 million to complete. We can also see how much time was spent on each of the phases and the approval process according to this study. This chart is also helpful in estimating the probability of success as we move through development. Let me point out that correctly estimating success is critical for the valuation of a drug as it moves its way through the process. For a single drug, success or failure is a binary event. However, in a portfolio of drugs, we can use historical data to estimate probabilities to better determine the value of a group of compounds. The previous slide provided statistics regarding historical approval rates using a 2003 analysis. We also found some more current information using a larger data set from the 2006 to 2015 period, which examined almost 7,500 development programs and calculated their success. And on this slide, uh, on the right, on the lower right, you can see a summary of that data. The study examined both the results for all indications and for 14 individual disease areas. We summarize only the results for all indications in the slide, but note that oncology had the lowest rate of advance to approval at 5.1%, and hematology had the highest at 26.1%. 
In oncology, it was by far the therapeutic area with the highest number of observations, with almost a third of the total. While the value of eventual sales is important, determining a reasonable probability of the drug being approved is also critical to the evaluation process. These figures provide a guide for estimating the likelihood of approval based on the stage the drug has reached. Further refinements from these rates can be made based on the analyst experience with the process and knowledge of the specific drug pipeline. These include management's experience taking previous compounds through the process, partnering with large pharma who have standardized processes and deep industry connections, and also specific drug characteristics and results that may suggest if the compound is more or less likely to be approved compared to others in its class. In our analysis, we take a conservative approach and attempt to find products that appear to have higher probabilities of approval based on their characteristics. <clears throat> Another helpful breakdown in the approval data compares new molecular entities, also known as NMEs, to biologics and non-NMEs. We can see from the chart that NMEs have a much lower rate of approval compared to non-NMEs. We're guessing that this is because many non-NMEs are intended for already approved indications and generally reflects new formulations or new methods of administration of old medicines. This provides a much less complex pathway as researchers and regulators already understand the underlying molecular entity. If the FDA finds no fault with the sponsor's IND, then he may begin with phase one trials after 30 calendar days. Phase one trials seek to verify safety and tolerability of the drug in humans and typically take from six to nine months. These are the first studies conducted in people. A small number of subjects, usually from 20 to 100 healthy volunteers, take the investigational drug for short periods of time. Testing includes observation and careful documentation of how the drug acts in the body, namely how it's absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted. Frequently, the trial will use an ascending dose approach where amounts of the drug are increased until clinicians determine a dose-limiting toxicity. There are no placebos in phase one testing. About 63% of phase one trials move on to phase two. Overall cumulative probability of approval for all indications from phase one is about 10%. Therefore, when you're analyzing a drug in phase one trials, one way to adjust for the likelihood of success is to use a DCF model and then apply the 10% probability of success to the DCF value of the drug candidate. After the drug is determined to be safe in phase one testing, it moves into phase two trials. This stage is designed to determine effective doses and further study the safety of the candidate drug in humans. Depending upon the type of investigational drug and the condition it treats, this phase of development generally takes from six months to three years. Testing is usually conducted with up to several hundred patients that have the target disease. This testing determines safety and effectiveness of the drug and establishes the minimum and maximum effective dose. Most phase two clinical trials are randomized or randomly divided into groups, one of which receives the investigational drug and another which receives a placebo and sometimes a third group that receives a current standard treatment. In addition, most phase two studies are double-blinded, meaning that neither patients nor researchers know who is receiving the investigational drug. Phase two trials can also be divided into A and B, where the phase two A trials explore the most effective dose range in pharmacodynamics, and two B trials emphasize efficacy. <clears throat> Frequently, the sponsor will request an end of phase two meeting with the FDA, where they can align expectations, trial design, and proper endpoints for phase three studies. The meeting also helps ensure the preclinical data with regard to duration, route of administration, and formulation are supportive of the dose to be used in clinical trials. Phase two trials have the highest failure rate of the three phases, as some drugs turn out to be ineffective, while others have safety problems or intolerable side effects. Based on the data in this study we cited, only about 31% of compounds end up moving from phase two to phase three. Based on the tough study, Efficacy and commercial viability were the top two reasons candidates were dropped after phase two trials. 
Overall, about 15% of candidates in Phase two trials are eventually approved by the FDA. So, when we're analyzing a drug in Phase two and determine our NPV, we apply a 15% probability of success to the DCF value of the drug candidate. Sponsors will consult with the FDA following positive results of Phase two trials in order to ensure Phase three trial design will satisfy the agency's needs and requirements. Close and frequent contact with the FDA is very important so that the pivotal Phase three trial meets the needs of the regulators in order to avoid rework and approval delays. The purpose of a Phase three trial is to provide expanded testing of effectiveness and safety of an investigational drug usually in randomized and blinded clinical trials. Depending on the type of drug candidate and the condition it treats, this phase usually requires from one to four years of testing. Phase three, safety and efficacy testing, is conducted with several hundred to thousands of volunteers that have the target disease. There are several common trial designs, such as randomized controlled, crossover designs, and factorial designs, to name a few. Phase three trials can cost from $50 million to hundreds of millions of dollars over their multi-year lifespan. The large cost means that many smaller companies that are developing a promising therapy and only have limited funding may seek a large pharma partner after generating strong phase two data. In this case, the larger pharma company will take the candidate through phase three trials and fund the process. This experience and infrastructure that the larger pharma brings to the table are valuable assets that help optimize trial design and streamline the process to ensure there are no delays and approval unfolds on the fastest track possible. Approximately 58% of phase three candidates move on to a new drug application, which is then filed with the FDA. Most compounds that fail to advance do so because they did not meet efficacy endpoints. Phase three, about half, are eventually approved by the FDA. When a sponsor completes the phase three work and has met the expected endpoints with appropriate safety, they'll then file a new drug application. The NDA seeks to establish whether or not a drug is safe and effective, determine the proper labeling for the product, and ensure that manufacturing processes conform to regulations. Along with submission, the sponsor of the drug must pay 2.3 million in application fees, as well as some other establishment and product fees. For some small companies and orphan designations, these fees are waived. After submission, the FDA reviews the NDA within 60 days and informs the sponsor by the 74th day if the submission was complete so that the formal review may begin. Most NDAs receive a response from the FDA within 10 to 12 months. For NMEs, the clock starts when the application is accepted and for non-NMEs, it begins when the application is received. If the drug qualifies for a priority review, it receives a response within six months. This time period generates the PDUFA date, which gains its name from the Prescription Drug User Fee Act. This is the date when the FDA is expected to provide a response to the NDA. Generally, in Zach's models, we anticipate about a year to hear a response, as sometimes there are delays if additional information is needed and sometimes the FDA falls behind its target. There are two types of NDA application pathways. New chemical entities are required to be submitted through the 505B1 pathway, and drugs that are reformulations of currently known and approved products are submitted through the 505B2. During the review, the FDA examines all of the information related to the drug, including the facilities that manufacture the product, and related control testing laboratories. The manufacturing component is extremely important, as in many cases, a drug is not approved due to problems with the manufacturing and testing, rather than for reasons of safety and efficacy with the drug. If the application is for a new drug, the FDA in many cases will convene an advisory committee, which is a panel of independent experts that reviews, evaluates, and recommends approval for a candidate. While the FDA does not have to follow the advice of the advisory committee, they do consider what the group has to say. After the FDA has completed the review process, they either issue a public approval letter or submit a complete response letter to the sponsor. Issuance of, a, issuance of an approval letter allows the sponsor to begin marketing the drug. Generally, 
They'll begin to develop the commercial supply chain and sales force during this time. Once a drug is approved on the basis of safety and efficacy, it is then published in the approved drug products with therapeutic equivalence evaluations, more simply known as the Orange Book. The Orange Book lists all drug products approved on the basis of safety and effectiveness by the FDA. There's also a book known as the Purple Book, and this lists all of the biologics based on the basis of safety and effectiveness by the FDA. Uh, if the drug is not approved, the, F the FDA will issue a complete response letter, or CRL, to the company. The CRL outlines the deficiency, provides a complete review of the data submitted, and then recommends the actions necessary to support future approval. If, if the problems highlighted are minor, the sponsor will address them and resubmit to the FDA, who then has two months to provide a response. If the issues raised are more complex, then the FDA has six months to consider the resubmission. CRL can delay approval by six months to a year or more, and sometimes it even indicates a dead end for a candidate. Referring back to the Biomed Tracker report, uh, NDAs have historically had about an 85% chance of being approved for all indications. The value of a drug is derived from the patent and exclusivity protection granted by governments and their agencies. Since the variable cost of manufacturing drugs is generally a very small percentage of the selling price, without protection, competition would bring prices down to a level where the company couldn't recover its development costs. Initial patent protection is 20 years in all major jurisdictions and begins at the time the patent is filed. Generally, patents are filed in the early days of research and as first investments are being made. At this stage of investment, there may be seven to ten years of research, clinical trials, and regulatory work to be done before the candidate is ready for commercialization. In many cases, this leaves only ten to thirteen years in patent protection for the company to recover the investments it's made. A combination of special allowances made by regulatory agencies and efforts on the part of pharmaceutical companies have provided a framework to extend the protection of intellectual property. One of these allowances is called Patent Term Restoration was enacted by Congress in the 1980s. This extension recognized marketing time lost while a drug candidate was being reviewed by the FDA. Patent Term Restoration allows for up to five years of patent extension, with the restriction that no more than 14 years of protection be allowed following the product's approval date. New product exclusivity is another type of IP protection. It gives five years of exclusivity running concurrent to any existing patent protection for a new chemical entity. This allows for drugs to be developed based on patents that may have already expired in order to incentivize new treatments. If a known compound is altered or reformulated and new research is required to obtain approval for the modified compound, it may qualify for a new clinical investment extension that will add three additional years of protection. This provides incentives for sponsors to develop new dosages, new methods of use, and extended release formulations of the same drug. As part of the Affordable Health Care Act, biologics will provide a 12 years of exclusivity following approval in the United States. This is a much longer period than that provided in other countries, and as part of the negotiation with pharma. The last type of exclusivity we'll discuss is pediatric exclusivity which adds an additional six months of protection to a drug. This is the only type of exclusivity that begins following the expiration of another type of protection. Before studies related, pediatric exclusivity can be started. The A must health benefits to the population and make a request to the sponsor to conduct the studies. Exclusivity is given whether or not the product is shown to the pediatric Beyond the protections listed, additional patents may be used for different methods of administration, manufacturing, and combination uses, to name a few. Most of these intellectual property rights are similar across jurisdictions in the EU, US, and Australia. I will move on to the generic process, which is the last stage of the drugs. Once the patent and, ex and exclusivity of protections expire, competitors will begin efforts to launch generic copies of the drugs. The first step for this is to file an abbreviated new drug application, or ANDA. Frequently, in response to the ANDA filing, the holder of the original NDA 
will file, file for an infringement action, result in an automatic 30-month stay at the end approval. The stay comes to an end when the court decides that the patent and exclusivity protections have expired. The end includes much of the same information required for an NDA, but, but relies on animal, human, and bioavailability studies used in the original NDA. In studies, the generic competitor provides evidence of bioequivalence. Upon approval of the ANDA, the first generic competitor to challenge the patent is granted 180 days or six months of generic exclusivity incentive to offset the cost and effort of the patent challenge. According to some statistics, generic manufacturers make over half of the profits from a generic launch to the period. Biosimilars are, in essence, generic biologics, highly similar to an already FDA-approved biological product with no meaningful differences in safety and effectiveness. Biosimilars are much more structurally complex than small molecule drugs as they are manufactured in living cells. This is in contrast to small molecule drugs that are manufactured using chemical synthesis. Due to the complexity of the manufacturing process for biosimilars, it's impossible for a competitor to make a perfect molecular copy of the approved biologic. Therefore, more tests and trials are required to obtain FDA approval for biosimilars. We can see a flow chart uh, that, that uh, is useful in terms of uh, going from the ANDA and walking through the FDA process. And feel free to refer to this later after the presentation uh, for a quick uh, um, after of how it, how, it, how it progresses. Accelerated approval. Um, the FDA and other regulatory agencies have recognized that there's a need to accelerate approval in some cases. Um, the first, uh, first type of uh, accelerated approval is called fast track. This is granted in cases where a candidate shows promise in treating a serious or life-threatening disease and it addresses an unmet need. The FDA determines that the application for fast track qualifies and the sponsor receives uh, several incentives. These include more frequent interactions with the FDA that revolve around each of the key milestones, such as the IND submission, completion of each of the phase trials, and discussion of endpoints and safety data. The FDA may also review parts of the marketing application early, uh, which allows for faster approval when the whole is ready. Uh, breakthrough therapy is a designation intended for drug candidates that treat a serious or life-threatening disease or a condition using preliminary clinical evidence. Um, a breakthrough, if it's uh, granted, if this breakthrough therapy is granted, then the sponsor gets more frequent meetings with the FDA and um, will also uh, help with the development of the drug, advice on trial design, and closer collaboration with uh, senior managers at the agency. Next is the accelerated approval program, which allows for faster approval of drugs for serious conditions that medical need. Uh, this faster approval relies on clinical trials uh, with surrogate endpoints. Uh, that demonstrate a clinical benefit. And uh, surrogate endpoints are important because they are easier to obtain. Uh, and one example of this would be uh, looking at a reduction in tumor size for a cancer drug rather than looking at overall patient survival, uh, just because overall patient survival takes a lot longer to, uh, to incorporate as part of the study. Drugs approved under the FDA accelerated approval program still need to be tested in clinical trials using endpoints that demonstrate clinical benefit, and these are the four, phase four confirmatory trials that I mentioned earlier. If the drug later proves unable to, start to uh, demonstrate clinical benefit, then the FDA uh, will withdraw approval. Uh, the fourth uh, program that's available is called Priority Review, and this is granted by the FDA for development for some tropical of uh, treatments for some tropical diseases. Um, and in this case, you think about Zika, uh, or Ebola or something like that. Um, and in return for developing an approved uh, treatment for tropical disease, they will receive a voucher uh, for uh, use on a subsequent drug that allows for six month approval time. Uh, a great feature with this uh, voucher is that it can be transferred or sold, uh, providing incentives to small companies that are focused on tropical diseases. And an example of uh, one of these uh, vouchers that was sold, that took place last year, 
where AbbVie bought, bought a priority review voucher from United Therapeutics for $350 million. So there's some value there. Um, interesting to see that, you know, the four months of, of, of additional marketing time in this case was, was valued at $350 million. Final important uh, area I want to talk about in terms of the approval process are orphan drugs. Um, these are drugs that, uh, this is a pathway that's become very popular in recent years um, because it allows for small little trial populations and potentially fast track approval. And there are also a, a number of incentives that are out there to help uh, orphan drugs get approved faster and more efficiently. Uh, the definition of an orphan disease is one that affects fewer than 200,000 persons in the United States. Uh, and in other countries, it's defined as being between one and five persons afflicted per 10,000. There are a number of benefits given to orphan drugs, including protocol assistance, grants, tax credits, exemptions from registration fees, and market exclusivity, among others. Due to the smaller trial size and quicker time to market, the cost of developing a drug for an orphan indication is much lower than that for other diseases. Receiving approval to file as an orphan doesn't prevent the company from, from pursuing other non-orphan indications later, and in many cases this is a strategy followed by biotech companies to uh, first get the product on the market as an orphan and then do the work to obtain appro approval for another more common disease. Now on this next slide here we can see a comparison of some of the incentives that are out there um, by geography for the orphan or rare disease category. The next slide uh, goes a little bit into um, uh, just a primer on clinical trial design. I won't spend too much time here because we're getting kind of to the end and into the part where we can have a chance to ask some questions. Um, but I just point out here that uh, sometimes you'll hear some very complex language used uh, with reference to a trial, and it usually includes some uh, of these terms right here. Uh, so it's just a good resource um, that, that you can use. Uh, the next slide uh, summarizes the main regulatory agencies that are out there. Obviously, we've all heard of the Food and Drug Administration, um, and then also the European Medicines Agency, and that uh, they do much of the drug approval work for the 28-member European Union, and then also you can see the agencies for Japan and Australia as well. And generally, these are, these are the top four most attractive markets based on uh, their size. And, um, you know, there's one important point I wanted to make about each of these markets. The U.S. is generally the one that is desired most. Uh, a few reasons for that, obviously, it's a, it's a wealthy country with a, a lot of people in it. Um, but there are also no price controls on drugs. So, uh, so if you multiply uh, quantity times price, it usually comes out to be much higher in the U.S. than in other areas. So this is obviously the first place that a, a company wants to, um, to come. Uh, I'll point out, though, in, in most other countries, including the EU, uh, that individual states will negotiate with drug companies um, for prices for their own uh, state health plans. So it's a little bit different process in other places. Uh, this is a helpful chart just in terms of, of seeing graphically how big the markets are in different parts of the world. The United States makes up over half of the total sales of new drugs. And as I said before, you know, the FDA is generally the first stop um, on the approval process that most companies make. Uh, Europe is number two at about a quarter. You see Japan at 10 percent, the third spot, and then everyone else is, uh, is down up to that. Uh, next, we have the uh, next point I want to make is just the size of the total drug market. It was about $1 trillion in 2014, so you can get a sense of the immense size of, uh, of this. So that, that, that wraps up my um, content slides. And right here is just a list of our companies that we cover at Zach's. We have about 40 to 50 right now. Uh, and one point I'll make is that we, uh, we don't have a a buy, hold, or sell recommendation. We just generate a target price, and we think this keeps things a lot cleaner um, approaching it this way. And this slide is very useful for anyone who wants to follow up. And some of the things I've mentioned, good resources, clinicaltrials.gov is, uh, is a good place to go to uh, look at how um, the trials that companies are performing are structured, uh, look at their endpoints, 
look at, uh, they also provide information on when they started and when they ended. Um, and then there's a couple other resources here as well. Uh, finally, I'll go on to the uh, contact slide if you have any questions.